Government to announce next course of action before the 4th of February. Five charged with drug trafficking. And you're watching News at 10 with me, Brendan Lepore. Senior Minister for Security, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, today has called on the public to remain calm as the National Security Council special meeting has yet to decide on the next course of action after the movement control order ends on the 4th of February. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said the government will announce whether the current movement control order, MCO, will continue or otherwise before the 4th of February. Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri said the government has to weigh in the matter first and the effects that it will bring on the country before they can reach to a decision. Yes, kita mahu menjaga kesihatan rakyat kita, tetapi dalam masa yang sama kita juga mahu melindungi kepentingan rakyat kita, terutamanya golongan-golongan miskin, rakyat yang miskin, pedagang-pedagang mikro. Pedaga-pedaga kecil-kecilan di tepi jalan yang terpaksa bergantung kepada pendapatan harian. Dan jika kita tutup, tentu akan menjejaskan mereka. Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said this following various reactions alleging the government would impose a total lockdown after the 4th of February. According to a report by the company's Commission of Malaysia, CCM, since October last year, over 13,000 companies had to shut down their operations causing thousands of employees to lose their jobs. Meanwhile, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri announced that starting from tomorrow, married couples who live in separate states will be allowed to return home. Couples, however, must acquire permission from the police beforehand. Jadi, seperti yang lain-lain juga. Walaupun ada kebenaran, kalau ada kes kecemasan, kematian, memang kita benarkan tetapi perlu memaklumkan kepada pihak polis dan mendapatkan kebenaran. Dato' Sri Ismail Sabri added that based on the advice of the Ministry of Health, MOH, the government agreed to allow couples who live far away from each other due to work purposes to meet their family. The senior minister added that for couples who experience symptoms of COVID-19, they are advised to undergo COVID-19 screenings before beginning their journey to meet their spouse. On to the COVID-19 updates, the number of recoveries once again exceeds the number of new cases, with 4,076 cases recovered today. This brings the cumulative number of cases recovered and discharged up to 149,160, which translates to a 78.3% recovery rate. On the other hand, the Health Ministry reported 3,585 new cases in the past 24 hours. According to a statement by its Director General, Tan Sri Dr. Norhesha Abdullah, Selangor recorded the highest number of new cases today with 1,295 cases, followed by Kuala Lumpur with 610 cases and Johor 516 cases. Following this development, the number of cases currently active has been reduced to 40,574. 280 cases are currently being treated in intensive care units, with 111 of them requiring ventilators. Seven new clusters were detected today, with three involving workplaces. MOH also reported 11 new deaths today, and the death toll has reached 700. Trangano recorded the highest COVID-19 daily estimated infectivity rate, RT or r naught as of yesterday at 1.36. The state health director, Dr. Nor Azimi Yunus, said the highest r naught recorded in Trangano was 1.52, with 179 infections on 24th January. In a Facebook post on her page, Dr. Noor Azimi reminded the public to take the issue seriously and comply to the SOPs and strategies to curb transmission in the state. 
in a related development, an infographic shared via Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah's Twitter account shown that after Tranganu, Malacca is the second highest at 1.28, followed by Srawa 1.25, Putrajaya 1.19, Pera 1.17, Kedah 1.15, Perlis 1.15, Kuala Lumpur 1.12, Labuan 1.11, Pahang 1.1, Selangor 1.1 and Kelantan 1.09. Johor, Sabah, Negeri Sembilan and Pulau Pinang are the lowest four at 1.04, 1.03, 1.01 and 1.0 respectively. Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham said the RT for the whole nation, on the other hand, stood at 1.04. The Health Director General explained that the R value for states is estimated with a 14-day moving window, while R value for the whole nation with a 7-day moving window. The head of a drug trafficking syndicate and four of its members were charged at the Johor Magistrates Court with multiple counts of drug trafficking. However, no pleas were recorded from all of the accused after the charges were read before Magistrate Nor Madiana Mamat. The suspects Go Chi Kwang, Lai Chang Pung, Lai Chang Lim, Boli Po Shaw Kiat and Li Chia Hui were facing a total of 18 drug trafficking charges. The leader of the syndicate, Go Chi Kuang, and his girlfriend, Li Chia Hui, were charged with three counts while Lai Chang Pung was facing five charges. Another suspect, Lai Chang Lim, was charged with three counts of drug trafficking and former charges were laid against Boli Po Shaw Kiat. They were accused of trafficking various types of drugs, weighing between 102 grams and 210 kilograms. The charges were framed under Section 39, Subsection 1, Subsection B, Subsection A of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952 that is punishable under Section 39B, Subsection 2 of the same Act, read together with Section 34 of the Penal Code, which carries mandatory death sentence if found guilty. The prosecution was conducted by Deputy Public Prosecutors Faisal Nur Hadi and Suryani Ujang, while all the accused were represented by counsels Dato Michael K. L. Chi and Kevin Kwa Kai Weng. The court set the 26th of April for mention of the case. Previously, it was reported that Johor police seized a total of 341 million ringgit worth of drugs through a series of raids earlier this month, which was deemed as the largest drug bust in the state. A Bangladeshi was sentenced to jail for two years and 12,000 ringgit fine at the Allo Star Sessions Court today after pleading guilty on the count of bribing a police personnel on 20th January. Judge Murtaz Zadi Amran meted out the sentence to Muhammad Mosaro, 30, who committed the offence at a police roadblock for not having a permission letter to cross the state border, as well as having no valid travel documents. According to the charge sheet, Muhammad offered 500 ringgit to Corporal Muhammad Shazwan Ahmad Safiuddin at the Plaza Tol Lunas BKE, kilometer 18.8, Lebohraya Butterworth Kulim, as an inducement to not take any legal actions against him. Muhammad was charged under Section 17, Subsection B, and 24, Subsection 1 of Malaysia Anti Corruption Commission MACC Act 2009. The prosecution was led by MACC Prosecution Officer Mohamed Fauzi Azizan while Mohamed was not represented. The National Security Council, MKN, issued a precautionary warning to all government agencies via the National Cyber Security Agency, NAKSA, to take necessary measures to prevent or reduce the impact of a potential cyber attack. The statement by MKN emphasized that the warning was issued after a video published by Anonymous Malaysia went viral on social media recently. NAKSA is also collaborating with the police to coordinate and plan their next moves. The government is highly focused on the technological infrastructure of the government information as well as the country's critical systems. This is underlined through the Malaysian Cyber Security Strategy, MCSS, launched last October. MCSS emphasized on efforts to strengthen the government ICT systems as well as national critical systems, which include increasing the knowledge, skills and capabilities of officers involved in the cyber security field.
yet to come. Full economic shutdown move must be thoroughly assessed. Stay with us. The country's economy needs more time to fully recover before recording any positive development. Now, the assumption that the economy will quickly recover amidst an economic shutdown is highly unrealistic. According to Senior Minister for International Trade and Industry, Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali, the suggestion and pressuring of fully closing down economic activities to curb the spread of COVID-19 must be meticulously studied to identify its advantages and disadvantages. The government can also consider other alternatives such as tightening of standard operating procedures, SOPs, as well as introducing clearer guidelines on geospatial planning or geographic information systems, GIS, data. Datuk Sri Mohamad Azmin also suggested increasing targeted screenings and regulating the price of RTK antigen test kits to ensure reasonable pricing. This will directly enable screening to be more accessible and widespread, especially on the industrial line. The operations of public hospitals, including university hospitals, military hospitals and private hospitals, will be hybrid, based on the concept of cluster hospitals under the integrated COVID-19 control centre. Chief Secretary to the Government, Tan Sri Mohamad Zuki Ali, said the move was intended to ensure systematic coordination can guarantee comprehensive and holistic health access for both COVID-19 patients and others. He also said that there would be an optimization of existing lab capacities, especially at government departments and public universities, for the purposes of large-scale testing and detection of COVID-19. Furthermore, there would also be mobilization of other medical resources, including equipment, personal protective equipment, PPE, and medicine according to the hospital's needs. Tan Sri Mohamad Zuki Ali said the Emergency Management Technical Committee will continue to monitor issues related to the implementation of the emergency ordinance, which can be brought before the National Security Council for consideration. The government has decided to mobilize the federal and state public resources with some of the civil servants may be required to temporarily move to other departments in need of additional support, especially health and safety services. Chief Secretary to the government, Tan Sri Mohamad Zuki Ali, said the initiative was aimed to ensure a smooth implementation of the state of emergency, adding that the Public Service Administration will not be affected during this emergency period. The release statement, he said the matter had become one of the main issues discussed by the Emergency Management Technical Committee, which has convened four times. He added that underutilized government assets, including vehicles, will be shared to support the operation of critical services so that it will be more integrated and coordinated. The government will also identify specific buildings and facilities that can be used as centres for the purpose of taking swab tests. He also said that the Ministry of Communications and Multimedia, KKMM, will collect all information, views and feedback on the state of emergency and force nationwide. The Ministry will also implement strategic measures such as creating special channels to ensure that all information regarding the emergency ordinance will be accurately and properly delivered to the people. 60% of the approved permit or AP holders which are involved in meat importing activities are Bumiputra companies. Agriculture and Food Industries Minister Dato Sri Dr Ronald Kiandi said this in rebuttal against the claim by former Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Agro-Based Industry Dato Sri Tajuddin Abdul Rahman that only 10% of AP holders are Bumiputra companies. 60% importers are Bumi Putra, orang yang Melayu dan Bumi Putra. Tetapi dari segi volume yang itu kita tak boleh tentukan. So we don't know. Kerana ada one is business to business, uh, urusan business to business. Katakan kita bagi uh, AP kepada uh, pembangang APA, berapa banyak dia uh, boleh mengimport itu adalah bergantung kepada kapasitinya, kapasiti dia di bawah. Uh, Banyak uh, ada pengimport Bumi Putra Melayu. Uh, seperti uh, Dara Beef, uh, Ramli Burger. Ini merupakan pengimport Bumi Putra yang uh, kehadapan dari segi kuantiti.
Meanwhile, regarding the AP holders blacklisted for violating the stipulated conditions, Dato Sri Ronald said the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries was still waiting for the results of the investigation from the relevant agencies. He added that if there is found to be a violation of the AP conditions, MAFI will take stern action towards the involved parties. The International Green Tech and Eco Products Exhibition and Conference Malaysia, or IGEM 2020, held from 19 until 23rd of October last year, had successfully generated potential investment of 3.4 billion ringgit. Environment and Water Minister Dato Sri Tuan Ibrahim Tuan Man said the event will continue to play a vital role as an annual platform of interaction among the industry players, entrepreneurs, non-governmental organizations, and the people to boost the development of the national green agenda. IGM 2020 telah mencatatkan peningkatan penyertaan syarikat antarabangsa, platform penganjuran secara dalam talian, membuka ruang yang lebih luas kepada pihak luar, sama pakar-pakar terkenal dunia dalam bidang teknologi hijau. Mereka terlibat secara aktif dalam sesi persidangan, sama ada secara langsung atau rakaman. Selain itu, para peserta juga telah berjaya meneroka pelbagai peluang dan kerjasama baru menerusi sistem padanan perniagaan. Speaking when announcing the outcome of IGEM 2020, he said the event had also created history as the first exhibition and conference events organized virtually in the new normal in Malaysia. This year, IGEM 2021 is scheduled to take place for six months, beginning the 1st of July to 31st December. A total of 25,000 micro, small and medium enterprises, MSMEs, including 12,500 new traders, are expected to participate in the Selangor Chinese New Year e-bazaar from the 1st of February until the 7th of March. State Executive Councillor for Investment, Industry and Commerce and SMEs, Dato Ting Chang Kim, said the campaign will provide a safe online platform for consumers to buy various goods at reasonable prices, just like the previous e-bazaars conducted by the state government. Explaining further, he said the campaign also aims to help SMEs and micro-businesses digitalize their businesses to continue to survive in the challenging economic situation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. He added that the state government will subsidize 2 million ringgit in the form of vouchers for purchases on e-commerce shopping platforms, Shopee and Lazada. He said the success of the two Selangor e-bazaar campaign last year proves that the state government's digital economy agenda is helping traders generate more income online. The Chinese New Year e-bazaar will be coordinated by Invest Selangor Berhad and Selangor Information Technology and Digital Economy Corporation, Sundaram Berhad. The local nuclear researcher expertise backed by laboratory facilities can potentially trigger the beginning of a new industry. This is in line with supporting Malaysia's efforts in becoming a technologically advanced country. Director General of the Malaysian Nuclear Agency, Dr. Siti R. Yasa Hashim, said this can be achieved through extensive research of rare earth elements, especially since the industry has attracted the attention of various parties recently. Speaking at the signing of the collaboration agreement between Green Snow Technology Center and Berhad, GTSB, and the Malaysian government held online, the deal will allow GTSB to fund and sustain the cost of rare earth mineral research projects in several selected locations nationwide. The agreement signing ceremony was held online with Saw Dato Nick Abdul Mubin, Nick Mahmoud representing GTSB and Dr. Siti Yasa representing the government. The aforementioned projects will involve the company's funds totaling 450,000 ringgit which will be implemented throughout a 12-month duration. Sports Zijia in tough draw for World Tour Finals in Bangkok. Stay with us.
National men's single shuttler Lee Zijia could not have asked for a tougher draw for the World Tour Finals debut in Bangkok this week. In the men's singles draw released today, the 22-year-old was bunched in what is a group of death alongside infam world number four, Victor Axelsen of Denmark, Taiwan's world number two, Chao Tianqian, and world number six, Anthony Ginting of Indonesia in group A. Zijia is under immense pressure to bounce back from his uninspiring displays in the last two meets. He could only reach the last eight in the first open, losing tamely to Tian Chen, and was then knocked out in the first round by India's Sameh Verma last week. National men's single coach Hendra Wan admits it's a tough draw for Zijia, but will try their best during the tournament, the third major event to be held in Bangkok this month. Persiapan kita terhadap Sejia dalam World Tour ini lebih fokus kepada aktif strategi dan meningkatkan kepercayaan diri. Karena dua turnamen yang kemarin nampak Sejia kehilangan kepercayaan diri dan game dia. Jadi sekarang kita fokus itu, kita harap di turnamen, setelah turnamen World Tour Final ini Sejia boleh mengeluarkan apa yang terbaik dari game dia. Fighting sampai habis. Hendra Wan added Zijia remains a work in progress, struggling to cope with the pressure and at times is hesitant in his execution. Although it was the 22-year-old's second competitive return, following a 10-month hiatus because of COVID-19, it was the world number 10's lack of consistency and determination that proved his undoing in the first two tournaments of the season. The BWF World Tour final starts tomorrow until 31st January at the Impact Arena. And that's it from us this evening. In our top story, governments will announce the next course of action before the 4th of February. Join us for updates at noon at 12.30 tomorrow. Till then, I'm Brendan LePaul. Thanks for watching.